Lately, I've been getting really into Last Epoch and decided to offer myself a challenge. Get every class and mastery combination to level 50 so I can make the ultimate class picking guide, offering my honest insight into how each mastery plays. My dear viewer, I actually did more than that because some of these characters are in their late 60s, 70s, and my Void Knight and Rune Master are in their 80s. Some may say I should get a life, or that I should touch grass, but I say that less sunlight means that I have more knowledge to impart onto you. So get comfortable, use the YouTube chapter system if one section seems super appealing to you, and get ready to choose your class. Before we get started, I want to mention that Last Epoch's absolute best quality is that you can understand everything about the game and its mechanics without a guide. We're looking at you, Path of Exile. So in this video, I'm going to do two things for you. First, I'll give an overview of each class, what type of gameplay you should generally expect from them, and how the mastery shakes up that gameplay and shapes it into something special. Second, for each mastery, I'll give you my opinion on the gameplay feel, some options for spells and builds that I made, and any closing thoughts that I might have on each of them. But my suggestion to you is that if you enjoy playing the game, just play. Take a spell you like and make it the focus of your next build. Last Epoch has so many endgame viable builds that it would be impossible to name them all. So experiment, have fun, and more importantly, fail spectacularly. If you've ever wanted to brew your own beer or go solo camping with no one but your dog, welcome to the Primalist class, the giant bearded woodsman we all didn't know we needed. The Primalist is your nature-attuned guardian of the forest archetype, using his bond with animals and the elements to deal heavy blows to his foes. A strength and attunement based class, the Primalist is considered to be one of the tankier characters, being able to jump into the fray and use his abilities to control the situation and manage large hordes of incoming enemies at once. The Primalist has access to a number of situational abilities, having a dedicated healing spell, elemental spells and totems, wolf companions for my fellow dog people out there, and of course, the best movement skill in the game, Fury Leap. As you level with the Primalist, you'll get access to the Summon Wolf spell where you can summon and power your wolf pack, Ice Thorns, an ice homing missile barrage that can freeze enemies, Fury Leap, the best movement skill in the game in terms of sheer fun you'll have, Summon Thorn Totem, a totem that shoots thorns at nearby enemies. Swipe, a physical attack that can buff you and your animal companions in multiple ways. Tempest Strike, an elemental weapon attack that can conjure the forces of nature with each swing of your weapon. Maelstrom, a personal storm that coalesces around you to deal damage to anyone caught within range. And Upheaval, a barbaric smash to the ground that causes heavy damage in a line in front of you. Putting points in the Primalist skill tree will also unlock Etera's Blessing, the powerful healing spell I was talking about. Warcry, a shout that stuns and causes all sorts of chaos to enemies around you. Summon Storm Crows, the ability to summon crow companions that cast lightning spells at your enemies. And Serpent Strike, a spear attack that causes heavy poison damage to enemies hit by it. Like I mentioned before, the Prime List has probably the most diverse set of skills, ranging from powerful elemental abilities, to hard-hitting physical attacks, to summoning companions and totems to fight alongside you. This is because the Prime List also has some of the most diverse masteries to choose from as well. First is the Shaman. This mastery is all about controlling the elements to cast powerful spells using totems and weapon attacks to sunder the battlefield and crumble enemies by simply being near them. By choosing the Shaman mastery, you have a reduced mana cost of using totems, you get a straight plus 10 increase to attunement, and you have plus 50% to all elemental resistances while you have an active totem on the field. Obviously, this mastery allows you to utilize totems as a much more prominent part of your build, and while it's definitely not necessary to be a shaman to use totems, it definitely gives you a lot of benefits. On top of straight stat increases, you also get access to the Storm Totem, a summon totem that casts lightning storms at nearby enemies, dealing heavy amounts of lightning damage. Putting passive points into the Shaman skill tree will unlock Tornado, the ability to call a tornado onto the battlefield, dealing damage and pulling in enemies that get near it. Earthquake, a big smash button that deals heavy damage to anyone caught in its area of effect. And Avalanche, a powerful channeling spell that allows you to rain down icy boulders at any location that you please. For me, the Shaman felt best when I leaned into the heavy smash elemental attacks, going with either the Earthquake or Avalanche spell. I tried my best to create a lightning focus build, using Storm Totem and Tempest Strike to deal consistent damage, Storm Crows to buff me and heal me, and Earthquake to smash things and cause more lightning storms. From my gameplay, you can see it ended up being a clusterfuck of multiple lightning storms, with all five of my abilities causing some kind of lightning strike to hit enemies around me. Next up is the Beastmaster. 
This mastery is exactly what it sounds like. You have access to four additional Animal Companion spells, so build your army and charge into battle alongside them. This is probably the simplest mastery of the three in my humble opinion, but it has one of the highest skill ceilings in the game, offering incredible build diversity depending on which animals you decide to take with you, with each different companion providing you with different spells that can be activated as long as they are summoned on the battlefield. It's almost like being a Pokemon trainer with realistic animals. You have to build your team of Pokemon in the best way possible to optimize your strengths and mitigate your weaknesses. By choosing the Beastmaster, you immediately increase your companion summon limit by 1, and both you and your minions deal 50% increased melee damage, so you're encouraged to jump into the fray and fight alongside your animal friends. As you put passive skill points into the Beastmaster tree, you'll get access to more companion summon spells, a bear which can act as a tank or brawler companion, a scorpion which deals high poison damage and can spray poison all over the battlefield, a frenzy totem which sends you and your minions into a frenzy increasing attack speed and damage, and finally a saber tooth tiger, a badass cat that can deal high damage and cause bleeds with an insane amount of efficiency. The gameplay of the Beastmaster is actually a lot more involved than just summoning an army of animal companions and just letting them run wild. You can actually jump into the fray and use melee attacks alongside them, working together to bring down enemies like a well-oiled machine. In addition to managing your own melee damage, each summon spell can be cast once to summon the companion, and, while the summon is still active, can be cast a second time to trigger a secondary effect. For example, your wolves can howl and increase you and your minions damage for a time. The scorpion can shoot poison to deal massive amounts of poison damage around it, and more. So part of having a good build for the Beastmaster is being able to maintain your max companion limits, inflict additional melee damage while staying alive yourself, and making sure that you utilize your companion's abilities to optimize your team's performance. Last but not least, we have the Druid. If you thought controlling other animals was fun, wait until you become one yourself. The Druid is your shapeshifter archetype, shifting between different forms to adapt to any situation you may find yourself in. Need a big tanky brawler to be able to take a hit and deal big damage? Shift into the werebear form. Need a spellcaster that's able to deal high damage from a distance? Use the spriggan form. Want an agile high damage melee fighter? Take up the swarm blade form. This is your jack of all trades build and can fill any role that you like. But unlike a jack of all trades who may be a master of none, this druid can actually be specialized to be a high performer in any type of combat. While it may not be the best at it, it certainly is extremely capable, with the werebear form being one of the strongest builds in the entire game. By choosing the druid mastery, you immediately receive a 20% increase to your health and mana, and you receive a buff that protects you with a 70% damage reduction for 2 seconds whenever you drop out of a druid form. You also gain access to the werebear form immediately and can start shapeshifting into this massive tattooed hunk of bear metal whenever you please. As you put points into the druid passive skill tree, you unlock the Spriggan and Swarmblade forms, as well as the ability to summon a Spriggan companion and cast the Entangling Roots spell, which keeps enemies stuck in place and deals damage over time to them. The druid's gameplay is all about mastering one or more of your forms. When you shift into a form, you're able to stay in that form until you run out of rage. Rage can be generated in multiple ways depending on how you build your character, but is used up as your ability resource in place of mana. Once your rage gets to zero, you will automatically pop out of your form and back into a weak little primalist. So make sure you either maintain your rage or prepare yourself to be stuck in human form for a while until your cooldown recovers. While in your shapeshift form, you get a new set of four special abilities on your ability bar and a fifth one to transform back into human early. These abilities cannot be specialized on a talent tree, but your shapeshift spell can be, where you can heavily buff your abilities and bring in the benefits of other skill trees for each of those abilities. For example, the Werebear can be specialized to link the Maul ability with the Fury Leap spell, giving you all the benefits of the Fury Leap skill tree while you slam the ground with your Maul spell. My favorite form is the Werebear, it just makes me happy to be able to crush my enemies and charge around the battlefield as a huge beastly monstrosity. I built into the physical damage side of the Werebear, giving myself a bunch of health and strength to increase the damage of my Maul ability. Like I said, I linked the Maul ability with Fury Leap so that I have more damage, faster cooldowns, and a brief bit of immunity while I'm slamming the ground. I would say that the biggest weakness of the Primalist class and all of its masteries is that the melee spells feel a little clunky to use and build. The two basic melee attacks you have to choose from, Tempest Strike and Swipe, both feel kind of bad when you first start to use them, and it takes a lot of careful building to make either of them feel really good and strong. 
Serpent Strike can be extremely powerful and actually scales well with all sources of poison, but it's kind of jarring to use. You have to stop moving for a second to lunge forward and strike enemies in line in front of you, so it can definitely break up your momentum and look a little awkward. But Serpent Strike is probably the best of the four melee attacks you have. The last melee attack is Upheaval, but it costs mana unless you specialize it to not cost mana, and honestly, it feels more like a physical spell in my opinion, not really a melee attack, and it still suffers a bit from feeling kind of weak until you heavily specialize in it. Swipe doesn't have much weight behind it because it's basically just a swing of your weapon and for the most part ends up looking and feeling like a basic attack. Tempest Strike feels a bit better than Swipe, but because the elemental damage is all based on proc chance, you have to build deep into a specific element on the skill tree in order to make it anywhere near reliable. I think the Shaman suffers most from this because the Beastmaster has animal companion gameplay to have fun with, and the Druid can shift into Druid forms that have much better feeling melee skills. The Shaman can't really get away from these three melee spells, and while yes, you also have access to Earthquake as a Shaman, which is a big smash button spell that feels great, Earthquake is more of a cast once for big damage, and not a consistent damage attack. It has a heavy mana cost, so you can't repeatedly cast it unless you have a ton of mana reserved and don't want to save mana for anything else like Totems or Fury Leap. Anyway, other than the melee problem, the Prime List as a class is still extremely fun to play. On top of that, if you happen to find a certain legendary helmet, you can turn your wolves into squirrels that follow you around and attack enemies, and their eyes turn red when you use the Frenzy ability. It's amazing. Thank you, Zizaran, for this incredible item. The master of the arcane, the conjurer of elements, the mage is your typical greybeard wizard archetype, and man, this guy don't mess around. He may look like Tywin Lannister, but he moves like Yoda from Attack of the Clones and casts spells like Sorcerer Mickey from the Fantasia movie. Yes, my references are fantastic, you can tell me so in the comments, thank you in advance. The mage uses powerful spells of all elements to remove enemies from the living, and uses Ward, a defensive regenerative shield, as a main source of defense. While at first you may think that the mage is your regular run-of-the-mill glass cannon spellcaster, he actually has plenty of ways to keep himself mobile, ward shielded, and armored fairly well, so you don't have to worry too much about launching nuclear warfare and leaving yourself completely vulnerable. Obviously, it's not as easy to build base defenses as, say, the Sentinel class, and you definitely don't start with as much health, but with careful build planning, it won't be a problem at all. In fact, Ward is kind of broken if you know how to use it. As a mage, you get access to Lightning Blast, your basic lightning spell, Fireball, your basic fire spell, Snap Freeze, a quick shot of ice that can freeze enemies in front of you, Elemental Nova, a tri-elemental explosion that damages enemies around you, Mana Strike, a basic attack that restores major amounts of mana on hit, Flame Ward, a defensive ward spell that also gives you access to Guaranteed Fire Aura, a damage over time triggered spell, Teleport, your incredibly basic mage movement spell, Frost Claw, your basic frost spell that shoots three icicles exploding on contact, and Static, a lightning spell that builds while you move and shocks enemies around you when you cast it. Like I said, the mage is the master of the arcane, and uses his arcane knowledge to conjure powerful elemental attacks and shields. One little piece of info that I always love to bring up about arcane mages in any game is that they don't actually cast fire, lightning, or ice spells like a shaman would. Instead, they manipulate arcane magic to give it the properties of the elements to fit whatever spell they're casting. So everything is arcane magic when it's coming from a mage, it just feels burning hot like fire, cold like ice, or shocks like lightning. In my opinion, the mage has some of the most satisfying spell effects in the game. My favorite out of the base mage spells is Glacier, a three-part combo frost spell that summons three different sizes of glaciers, getting bigger as it moves further from you. Technically, you unlock this spell as you level up, along with Disintegrate, also a great looking spell that channels a lightning and fire beam, very common in ARPGs. Volcanic Orb, a moving fiery orb that shoots out multiple fire projectiles as it moves. And Focus, a channeling spell that gives you increased mana and war generation. The mage is intensely mana hungry at lower levels, so you do want to be cautious at how many mana heavy spells you're using. For the most part though, as long as you have some good mana regen or specialize a mana regeneration spell, you can build yourself out of any mana problems you may have. In fact, some spells and passives actually scale with mana, so you're rewarded for building more mana and don't have to give up on too much damage. Another thing to keep in mind is that depending on the skill, you can actually change the element of some spells to fit whatever build you want. You can do this on other classes too, not just the mage, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. If you want to make Lightning Blast a cold spell, Fireball a lightning spell, or Frost Claw a fire spell, you can do that. The Rune Master is the latest mastery to be added to the game, and it's also one of the most complex. But don't let its complexity scare you away. The Rune Master is easy to learn, hard to master, with a high skill ceiling, but a low skill entry level. 
Most of the complexity comes from the Rune Master's signature ability, Runic Invocation. In addition to 30% increased elemental damage and 10% increased cast speed, by choosing the Rune Master, you get access to Runic Invocation. Runic Invocation is a spell that you can cast to trigger one of 40 different spells, depending on the combination and order of the runes that you've stored up. The runes are generated based on the spells you use and correspond to that spell's element. For example, Fireball will generate a Fire Rune, Lightning Blast a Lightning Rune, and Frost Claw a Frost Rune. Also, keep in mind, the type of rune you generate will be based on the spell's elemental tag, so remember that if you changed Lightning Blast to Cold, you'll generate a Frost Rune instead of a Lightning Rune. You can store three runes in any order, but as you cast a fourth spell, the first rune will drop off and the fourth rune will be added. So as you attack enemies, you can change the spell that Runic Invocation will cast to fit whatever situation you are in. Some spells are AoE, some are powerful single target, some are more defensive or offer ailments to enemies or buffs to your characters. This is where the complexity can come in, being able to generate a specific rune combination to trigger the right spell at the right time. As you put points in the Rune Master tree, you get access to Flame Rush, a movement spell that turns you into Fireball and charges through enemies, Frost Wall, a wall of ice that can slow and freeze enemies, Rune Bolt, a tri-elemental arcane bolt that can be specialized to help generate specific rune combinations for runic invocation, and Glyph of Dominion, an area spell that slowly damages anyone inside the glyph that explodes once it reaches full power. I built the Rune Master to generate only fire runes because my goal was to create an Ignite build. The explosions were powerful of course, but they were mostly just there to look pretty and spread my Ignite stacks. With Glyph of Dominion I was able to get over 50 Ignite stacks on large enemies and around 500 base Ignite damage per 2.5 seconds. Not to mention all of the fire shred I was able to inflict with my fireballs. I don't make build guides, but this is one character that I've played around with a lot, so if you see me playing Last Epoch on Twitch you can definitely ask me to explain my build. It changes a lot. The next mage mastery is the Sorcerer, the straight up original spellcaster packed with big f**k you spells that look cool and take a lot of mana to power. The Sorcerer's gameplay is all about using strong spellcasting to make up for its lack in mobility or defenses, scaling all of its damage with how much mana the spell costs, meaning you're rewarded for casting big high cost spells from a distance to keep yourself out of trouble and away from a potentially mana-less close encounter with enemies. By choosing the Sorcerer, you get 50 additional base mana, and your spells will now scale with the increased damage based on how much mana they cost to cast. You'll also get access to the Meteor spell, the ability to call down a Meteor from the heavens to crush your enemies. Meteor is probably the best selling point to choose a Sorcerer. You literally conjure a massive flaming rock, and it scales extremely well with fire damage and the Sorcerer's mana damage scaling. As you put points in the Sorcerer Passive Skill Tree, you get access to Static Orb, a ball of electricity you shoot at a location that explodes on contact and shocks enemies in an area, Ice Barrage, a line of ice shards that will shoot in a direction for 5 seconds, Arcane Ascendance, a channeled spell that increases your damage by a crap ton but drains mana and roots you in place as a trade-off, and Black Hole, a spell that creates a black hole at a location, pulling in enemies and dealing massive damage to them over its duration. Anyway, as a big spell sorcerer, you're going to want to keep watch on your mana and your defenses because get caught without either of them and you're sure to have a bad time. I can't tell you how many times I've been caught in the middle of a bunch of enemies that jump at me and I can't teleport away because I've blown through my mana on static orbs. For my sorcerer, I wanted to focus on cold damage, changing lightning blast and static orb to cold in order to use black hole as my crowd control spell. Basically, I wanted to use black hole to round up all the enemies in front of me, blast them with a fuck you static orb, and then finish them off with fast chain lightning blasts. I went cold because you can stack frostbite and it does a bit of extra damage over time, and I wanted to be able to scale all my damage with black hole, since that spell can only scale with cold or fire. Added bonus was that things get slowed with chill and can sometimes freeze, so it gives you an extra layer of protection to be able to keep your distance. Don't know if it's endgame worthy, but it's definitely fun to look at. I have a lot of builds like that. The last mastery is the Spellblade, and this one is the mage's wild card. This is basically a melee magic user, getting up close and personal with melee attacks that have a specific elemental bonus for its source of damage. The two signature abilities for the Spellblade are Shatter Strike, a cold melee attack that has a high chance to freeze enemies around you, and Flame Reave, a slow swing of your weapon that shoots waves of flames that cleave enemies in front of you. As you continue into the Spellblade's passive tree, you get the Enchant Weapon spell, an almost necessary spell that can heavily increase your weapon attack damage as long as you keep it up, Firebrand, a melee fire attack that gets bigger and stronger with each subsequent hit, and Surge, a dash lightning attack that can be used instead of teleport as a movement spell. The Spellblade is one of the more interesting out of left field masteries, seeing as you would never expect this old spellcaster guy to be moving in and out of combat, swinging around swords and maces and stuff. But I gotta say, it works. It's an interesting idea, and I like the class fantasy around it. 
I'm also incredibly interested to see how people have built the Spellblade, because I would assume that it requires a heavy investment in defenses, and a well-managed ward shield as well. For my Spellblade, I ended up just trying to build the image that I had in my mind, which was this old samurai-style dual sword wielder who uses cold spells to enhance his blades with the power of frost to freeze his enemies and slice them into bits before they can retaliate. I think I did a pretty good job of making that a reality. Shatterstrike was my main spell with enchant weapon to empower every hit. I had Surge and Flame War to keep me safe and mobile, and Mana Strike to recover my mana because my Shatterstrike consumed it up super fast. Once I got to 50, this build really clicked because I was able to specialize into having my Shatter Strike repeat on its own for a couple seconds, giving me a chance to use Mana Strike to recover the mana I just spent on those Shatter Strikes. So it actually turned into this extremely high attack speed freeze build that I could sustain as long as I weaved in Mana Strike. Anime Samurai Warrior becomes a reality. The Mage is an extremely powerful class, and each of its masteries bring their own interesting gameplay style to shake it up and make the spellcaster archetype have a pretty diverse set of skills. I would say the only weakness of the class would be the mana management, and how squishy he is until you build some major defenses. But like I said, once you figure out how to generate a ward shield and have some good mana regen, you'll be able to sustain some pretty powerful builds with any of the masteries. In my opinion, it kind of mirrors the Sentinel class. The Sentinel has inherent defenses and you need to build power, while the Mage has inherent power and you need to build defenses. For all you plate wearers, shield bearers, and spin to win debonairers, let me introduce the Sentinel. The answer to the question, can you ever have enough defenses in an ARPG? The answer is no, you can't, because the Sentinel has multiple ways to scale your damage with your defenses. Basically, the more defenses you have, the more damage you do. The Sentinel is your basic heavily armored knight archetype, and mostly uses strong weapon based attacks to cut down enemies that dare stand in the way. Your basic abilities are Vengeance, a melee attack that allows you to repost an incoming attack. Warpath, the aforementioned spin to win spell. Hammer throw, the ability to throw a hammer. Lunge, a movement spell that allows you to charge at an enemy. Rive, a three hit basic attack combo. Shield bash, a strong directional bash with your shield that can stun enemies in front of you. Javelin, the ability to throw a javelin. And void cleave, a large cleave with a two handed weapon that can do extremely heavy void damage. As you level your Sentinel, you get access to Rebuke, a defensive and buff spell that reduces incoming damage for a short time, Shield Rush, another movement spell that has you charge in a direction using your shield as a battering ram, Multi Strike, an AoE basic attack that allows you to hit multiple enemies at once, and Smite, a holy fire spell that deals damage and heals allies. The Sentinel is a heavy armor wearer, so a lot of your gameplay will focus on standing toe to toe with your enemies, trading blows and making sure you can kill them before they can kill you. You don't need a shield to do this, you can use two-handed weapons and increase your damage while letting your armor and defensive skills keep you alive. In fact, one of the most popular builds in the game is the Void Echo Warpath build, which has you take up a two-handed axe and continuously spin to win in every map without letting your sentinel take a breather. But most of this class's identity comes with its masteries, particularly because your choice comes down to one of three main heavy armor archetypes that almost every game has. First up is what I feel to be the most popular mastery, the Void Knight. The Void Knight is the badass knight in dark armor that uses the power of the Void to obliterate enemies and send them into the darkness of the everlasting cosmos. This is your Death Knight, Dark Knight, Fallen Knight, Shadow Knight, Shadow the Hedgehog archetype you'll find in any ARPG, and boy did EHG give this guy some kicks. By choosing the Void Knight, you automatically get a 75% increase to your melee void damage, and you have a 10% chance for all of your spells to be repeated by a Void Echo, half a second after the original cast. You also get access to one of the most satisfying skills in the entire game, Erasing Strike, which is basically just a big smash button, but it's purple and enemies are literally deleted from existence. I'm not even joking, that's what the tooltip says. As you put points into the Void Knight skill tree, you'll get access to Volatile Reversal, an interesting time warp spell that returns your character to the state it was in two seconds prior, Abyssal Echoes, a void damage over time spell that can affect multiple enemies around you, Devouring Orb, a spell that places an orb on the battlefield that will pulse damage as you kill enemies around it, and Anomaly, a powerful defensive spell that can cause large groups of enemies to be removed from the fight temporarily and come back with debuffs or ailments. The Void Knight is the ultimate flex class, with big, fancy purple spells and attacks that make you feel big even when your build is technically small. A lot of new players find themselves trying out the Void Knight first, simply because its defenses come inherently with the Sentinel class, and the damage is super easy to scale with Void spells. 
There's not much to worry about here, and I guarantee that if you've played an ARPG before and you choose this mastery, you will most likely be able to reach monoliths without too much of an issue. I chose to build my Void Knight with two main spells, Warpath as my spin to win consistent damage attack, with Lunge to help me move around the battlefield faster, and for my big smash button, I chose a Racing Strike. My gameplay is just to spin around the map, killing everything around me, and if something is taking too long to bring down, I delete it from existence with a Racing Strike. It's so satisfying to see the enemies disappear. Next is the Paladin, the complete opposite of the Void Knight. This is your Righteous Fire Holy Warrior archetype that you'd find in any game, and that's basically all you really need to know about a Paladin. He likes big armor and holy spells, he buffs and heals allies, he smashes things with the power of a thousand suns. By choosing the Paladin, you deal increased fire, lightning, and physical damage equal to your percent health remaining, so basically, the closer to full health you are, the more damage you do, and you get 1% increased healing effectiveness per point of attunement. These two benefits tell you exactly what kind of gameplay the Paladin is all about. Do some awesome damage and smite enemies with Holy Fury, or build attunement and buff your healing abilities for you and anyone who joins your party. If that wasn't enough, you also get access to the Holy Aura spell, which gives a 30% increase to damage and 15% additional elemental resistance to you and your allies. You can also trigger the spell to double that buff for a short period of time. So if you can't tell, the Paladin is the peak party support mastery. Once the online becomes a little bit more stable, I can see every endgame optimized group having a Paladin that heals and heavily buffs the party. Solo play, however, is still incredibly easy and fun, because like with the Void Knight, you already have built-in defenses from the Sentinel class, and the Paladin builds on top of that to make it one of the best self-sustaining masteries in the entire game. As you put points into the Paladin skill tree, you'll get access to a dedicated healing spell called Healing Hand, a regenerating health and damage buff called Sigils of Hope, and a powerful Holy Fire spell called Big Smash Button Judgment. I chose to build my Paladin as a very tanky, in-your-face kind of fighter, with Shield Rush and Judgment as my main two spells. Basically, I would Shield Rush in, Shield Bash to stun everyone in front of me and shred their defenses, and then cast Judgment to watch them be crushed by my Holy Wrath, the power handed to me by God himself. I of course used Holy Aura to give myself passive defenses and activate it when I need the extra boost for bosses, and finally I had Rive to clean up anything that may be still moving after I crushed them with my other spells. The final mastery is the Forge Guard, and this one is an incredibly cool concept, but in my opinion needs a bit of love to make it feel fun to play and build in different ways. The Forge Guard is a skilled blacksmith who uses his mastery of the forge to create armor and weapons that can take on a life of their own, fighting alongside him and taking the stats of the equipment that he's currently wearing. This is kind of like a medieval engineering mastery, where you build enemies to fight your battles. The only difference is, here you are literally fighting alongside a manifestation of the armor and weapons that you've created for yourself. By choosing this mastery, you'll get an additional 35% physical and fire resistance, and you'll receive 3% increased armor for each hit you've taken in the last 10 seconds. So again, built-in defenses so you can create the tanky, heavily armored character you've always dreamed of. You also get access to the Forge Strike ability, which is a melee slam attack that has a chance to create manifestations of your weapon that will act as minions and fight alongside you for a short while. As you put points in the Forge Guard tree, you'll get access to Shield Throw, the ability to throw a manifestation of a shield, Manifest Armor, the ability to summon a manifestation of your armor, Ring of Shields, taking the manifestation of your shield and encasing yourself in it, and Smelter's Wrath, a big channeled fire spell that burns everything in a cone in front of you. For my build, I decided to manifest my armor and throw my shield at it, causing fire damaged enemies around the armor caught in the shield's explosion. I also chose to take Forge Strike to summon a bunch of little weapons to go fight people, and to be honest, it works. I don't die, I have so much built-in defense I can pretty much outlast anyone, so my gameplay tends to be throwing shields and forging weapons to fight for me. It is a little lackluster though, so I've been looking to find ways to make it a little bit more engaging. That's where I felt the Forge Guard lacks a bit. Kind of like the Shaman earlier in the video, the Forge Guard feels kind of clunky to play. That is unless you use Shield Throw. Shield Throw feels totally fine. You can link it up with your Manifest Armor to do loads of damage with it, but I don't really feel like anything else syncs up well with those two skills. Forge Strike and the minions it creates are totally fine, but it's not mana efficient, so you'll need to have some serious mana regeneration to use alongside Shield Throw or anything else. And it's not powerful enough on its own to use as a main spell, at least not reliably. Smelter's Wrath needs a lot of careful specialization to make it worthwhile, which means you can't reliably use it until endgame when you can reduce the charge time or buff the damage by a ton to make it worth waiting for. Ring of Shields is a fine defensive, but again, it's not mana efficient, so really you're relying a lot on the normal sentinel spells to make the Forge Guard feel good to play. 
It's not that it's not fun. Every class in Mastery can be fun if you build it the way that you want to play. But I feel like maybe it needs a little love from EHG to make the Forge Guard spells a little bit more reliable. Because if not, why wouldn't you just go for Paladin or Void Knight instead? The Sentinel class doesn't have many weaknesses, but if I had to say one, it's that you're mostly melee for the majority of your spells. Melee builds in ARPGs are a little bit more intimidating because you absolutely have to have good defenses for a melee character. You are always in the middle of a fight surrounded by enemies. You can get overwhelmed pretty easily, which means giving up on at least some damage to keep up those defenses once you get into the endgame. But honestly, you don't really need to worry about that too much until you get to the endgame, and by that time, the test of balancing offense and defense is a welcome challenge. If you choose the rogue class, you are automatically edgy and cool, and may want to look into getting some fingerless gloves. The rogue is your quick-moving trickster archetype, allowing you to choose between long-range bow attacks and in-your-face melee attacks. The rogue benefits heavily from dexterity-based gear, with most of your early passive skills focusing on dodge chance and mobility. Your class skills are Flurry, a quick 3-combo weapon attack, Shurikens, a skill that throws shurikens in a cone in front of you, Shift, your basic rogue dash, Acid Flask, a skill that throws an Acid Flask at a target location. Puncture, a quick powerful weapon attack that has the chance to inflict empowered bleeds. Cinder Strike, an elemental attack combo. And Umbral Blades, a combo ability that throws blades out in front of you and then recalls them from the ground, damaging enemies on the way back. Putting points in a rogue passive tree will also give you access to Smoke Bomb, Decoy, and Ballista, which are exactly what they sound like. The first two being used as evasive maneuvers, and the Ballista a minion skill that summons a stationary Ballista to shoot enemies around you. The Rogue specializes in fast-paced combat and can heavily increase their movement and attack speed with plenty of sources of haste thrown in the mix as well. Whether you specialize in bows or melee weapons, the gameplay is heavily geared towards a hit-and-run tactic, using your evasiveness and combat strategy to keep you alive while maintaining a high damage output. The two masteries available at the time of this video are the Blade Dancer and the Marksman. The Falconer is still being worked on and I'll release another video to cover that mastery when it comes out. The Blade Dancer Mastery is a badass ninja-like melee master specializing in throwing skills and quick high mobility melee strikes. Choosing this mastery basically makes you the star of your favorite anime, attacking from the shadows and using your best shadow clone jutsu to make copies of yourself and attack your enemies from all sides. By choosing the Blade Dancer you automatically get plus 15 extra melee physical damage and 15% more dodge rating, but more importantly you can summon an additional shadow clone. You also get access to the Dancing Strike skill, a dual wielding attack that allows you to dash around the battlefield faster than I would at an all-you-can-eat buffet. As you put more points into the Blade Master skill tree, you'll unlock Shadow Cascade, a circular spin attack that is also cast by any Shadow clones you have active, Synchronized Strike, an ability that allows you to jump from the shadows and slash at your target, creating two Shadow clones on either side of you, and Lethal Mirage a high damage ability that has you strike random enemies around the battlefield, moving so fast that you literally disappear for a moment. So with the Blade Dancer, the idea is you'll get up close and personal with your enemies, but usually dispose of them so quickly they don't have a chance to see you, much less attack you back. You move quickly, jumping in and out of melee range using skills like Synchronized Strike to deal massive damage on your own and with your Shadow Clones, and then move on to the next opponent. For my build, I decided to do just that. I buffed my Synchronizing Strike ability to dive into the fray and use shurikens to damage enemies from afar, performing a beautiful dance of jumping in and being just out of reach of the enemy's attacks. I did also try to buff my decoy as much as possible though because being scared of death is my ninja way. As a rogue, your other choice is to go with the Marksman. This is your bow master, using multiple range attacks and spells to move around your enemies and bring them down before they can ever reach you. This is every Lord of the Rings nerd's chance to become Legolas, or maybe Hawkeye, whichever fits your fancy. The Marksman is extremely versatile, having the ability to build slow, strong attacks like a sniper, or quick, penetrating spread shots like you're playing Call of Duty ruining everyone's day with a shotgun. As the Marksman, you get access to a number of ways to buff your arrows with elemental damage or increase your base physical damage. Just by choosing this mastery, you get a straight 50% damage increase to bows, and you receive a buff that increases your attack speed and stacks when you hit an enemy with a bow attack. You also get access to the detonation arrow ability, an explosive arrow that deals lightning damage to any enemy around your target, and as you put more points in the marksman skill tree, you get access to multi-shot, a spread shot ability that shoots arrows in a cone in front of you, dark quiver, a spell that drops retrievable arrows around you that give you buffs when you pick them up, and my favorite, hail of arrows. 
With hail of arrows, you shoot up an arrow volley into the air, and over the next couple of seconds, they rain down on enemies at your target location. My favorite part is I expect this Sky Strike node, which makes the initial hit of hail of arrows have an extra, extremely powerful kick to it. I don't actually know if this is a good optimized setup, it just feels good to press the button and watch my enemies get hell rained down on them. The rogue and its masteries are strong, quick, and versatile, but one weakness, if you could call it that, it's more of a mechanic that you have to pay attention to, is that a lot of the passive skills have you rely on dodge chance as your defensive attribute. Which makes sense, that's the whole point of being a rogue, right? You'll want to keep in mind though that being able to dodge is really great, until it isn't. Once you get hit by something, you will get rocked into next week. So make sure that you build armor or leech or other forms of defense so that you can recover from attacks that get through your dodge chance. Dodge is totally fine as a defensive mechanic, it's just not as consistent as armor and resistance is, so you have to be careful. But that's it, that's the rogue. Super fun to play, extremely versatile, so there are tons of different builds to explore that are totally worthwhile to play. And on top of that, fingerless gloves are completely underrated. They keep your hands warm, but allow you to use a touchscreen. Like this is peak glove technology. Pale skin, eyeliner, My Chemical Romance, Evanescence, hating your parents even though they're just doing their best. Let's go ahead and get all the classic emo teen jokes out of our system. This is the Acolyte, the Maiden of Darkness, the Master of Forbidden Magic. She uses powerful necrotic and blood spells to raise dead, manipulate blood and bone, and quickly rip her enemies apart, or curse them and drain them of their life until they wither away for good. As an acolyte, you get access to Rip Blood, a spell that literally rips blood out of your enemy's veins to heal you, Summon Skeleton, the ability to summon skeletal warriors, archers, and rogues, Marrow Shards, a spell that fires sharpened bones from your body to impale enemies at a distance, Wandering Spirits, the ability to call spirits to fill the battlefield and cause damage to enemies, Harvest, your basic melee ability that can tear the souls from cursed enemies, Bone Curse, a curse spell that you place on an enemy that triggers when they're hit, causing extra damage, Transplant, a movement spell where you create a new body at the target location, leaving your old body behind to explode and cause damage to enemies around it. And Summon Volatile Zombie, the ability to summon explosive zombies that will rush enemies in a suicide mission. As you level with the Acolyte, you also get access to Hungering Souls, a spell that conjures hungry souls to go eat enemies. Summon Bone Golem, the ability to summon a huge monstrosity that will defend you like a mama bear. Spirit Plague, a necrotic damage over time curse. And Infernal Shade a debuff that causes damage over time to whoever is branded by the Infernal Shade. Summoning build, minion builds, curse builds, all the common dark magic builds are here, depending on what type of build you want to play. Lots of cool cultist type magic to use to your advantage. I would say the gameplay is fairly similar to the mage, but one key difference is that while the mage specializes in big fuck you spells, the necromancer specializes in a lot of instant cast minor spells that can overwhelm enemies with damage over time, or a quick death by a thousand cuts from summoning 30 minions to fight your battles for you. Like the mage though, you will need to focus on building defenses so you can stay alive long enough to spread your curses and watch your enemies die. It can take some time to set up your attack combos, especially on bosses, so having multiple ways to be able to take hits or keep enemies away from you can go a long way. One example I can give you is that you can use one of your minions, the Bone Golem, to act as your tank and draw a threat away from you. It will take all the hits that you can't and heal you when it does damage. Another example is you can use the Bone Armor buff from the Transplant Tree that gives you multiple buffs when you use the skill. So just because the defenses aren't smacking you right in the face like with the Sentinel, the Acolyte does have plenty of ways to stay alive. The Acolyte has two masteries out right now, the Necromancer and the Lich, with another one called the Warlock still in development. First let's talk about the Lich. This is probably the most badass of all the masteries you can choose from. You don't summon a Lich, you are the Lich. By choosing the Lich Mastery, you get access to an increased companion limit, increases by one, and you get a buff to you and your minions that gives you 50 increased melee damage. You also get access to the Reaper Form, the main skill of the Lich, that turns you into a Reaper to deal increased necrotic and melee damage, attacking with two huge scythes that sweep across the battlefield with a spell called Reap. I'm gonna be honest, the class fantasy with the Lich is big for me. I can't tell you how cool I thought the Lich Mastery looked when I first started playing. And then I tried it, and the gameplay didn't immediately jump out at me. The early game Lich was just not that fun for me. 
So I stopped playing it at level 30 and didn't come back until I was making this video. And after playing it for another 24 levels, I finally found something that clicked. It's not perfect, but it works. And that's using the Lich form to power the Drain Life and Harvest spells. As you put points in the Lich passive tree, you get access to Drain Life, a spell that continuously drains the life from enemies to heal you at the cost of large amounts of mana. Aura of Decay, a poison aura that you can toggle on and off to spread poisons extremely efficiently. Soul Feast, a spell that deals extreme damage to cursed enemies, giving you ward for each soul that you feast on. And Death Seal, a spell that seals your current health for a duration in order to increase your damage. As you can probably tell, the theme of the Lich is blood and death, and taking the life of enemies to power your own. Super Metal. The Reaper form looks amazing, and when you use Harvest and Reap, your two melee spells, you swing your scythes over the enemies so smooth like butter, almost as if you're slicing through their spirit and not their physical bodies. Drain Life is my main spell, mostly because it's fun to point in a direction and see the enemy's health bar drop, but also because it allows me to stay in my Reaper form longer. The Reaper form drains your own life as a timer, causing you to transform back into a human if your health reaches zero. So to keep yourself in Reaper form longer, you want to keep your defenses high, use potions or spells to regain health, and specialize in passive skill nodes that reduce health drain. Staying in Reaper form is almost necessary since the buffs and mobility it gives you are so dramatically helpful. When you turn back into human, you feel incredibly weak, even though you can still technically use other spells. It's similar to the Druid transformations, except the Druid feels way weaker when out of form. The other mastery available right now is the Necromancer. This is your summoning build class, stacked with all sorts of undead to summon and ways to enhance them with different damage types, different spells, or alter them to specialize in a certain type of combat. This was the first mastery I ever played in Last Epoch, and my only goal was to make my own army of the undead. And let me tell you, 10 skeletal archers, 4 skeletal death knights, 1 bone golem, 1 bone minion, and 8 wraith slater, my army feels pretty damn complete. As a necromancer, you're given one skeleton and one skeleton mage added to your skeleton limits for those spells, and your minions get a straight 50% increase to their damage. You also get access to the summon wraith mastery skill that summons temporary wraiths to chase down your enemies and cause havoc before they're pulled away by the afterlife. As you put points in the necromancer passive skill tree, you get access to the summon skeletal mage spell, summoning skellies, but this time they do magic, sacrifice, the ability to explode one of your minions to deal damage to enemies around it, Dread Shade, a buff that you can put on one of your own minions to drain their life in order to increase their damage and the damage of minions around it. And Assemble Abomination, a spell that combines all your minions into a huge combo mashup monstrosity and sets them loose on the enemy for a short time. The Necromancer is rewarded for playing around with your different types of minion combinations and specializations, similar to how the Beastmaster plays. Each of the minions you can summon can be altered in different ways, they can do different types of damage or summon different specialized versions, they can be buffed or exploded at will to cause massive amounts of damage. Many of your available spells from the Acolyte or Necromancer tree can also interact with your minions in different ways, giving you plenty of options to combine spells and minions for powerful builds. The best part about the Necromancer, and probably why it's, in my opinion, the simplest mastery to play as a new player, is that it's pretty easy to just overwhelm most of your enemies with powerful minions, and you can just stay as far away from the battle as possible so you don't get hit by any enemy attacks. It's also extremely easy to build a summoner because you can focus on your defenses and let the minions do all the damage. If you have 20 different minions fighting on your behalf, you can focus on building your armor or dodging boss mechanics and every so often just resummon any minion that might die. The only downside to this is that after a while it can get pretty boring to let the minions do all the work. Your gameplay just becomes running around avoiding stuff while your minions have all the fun with combat. You become a commander, barking orders to your soldiers, and while that might be a great tactic strategy wise, in the fictional world of an ARPG it may be more fun for you to get your hands dirty and kill the enemies yourself. Alright, you've now been briefed on every single mastery in the game to date, with the Falconer and Warlock classes still in development to be discussed later. I want to thank you for watching the video. It was super fun to make, and I hope it was informative enough that it got you excited to play, but not informative enough that you still have some surprises and some build strategy to start thinking of. Remember that the majority of the fun you'll have in this game is making your own builds, trying new classes out and seeing what works, and yes, eventually blasting into the endgame systems with one character that you absolutely love. So don't worry too much about knowing everything when you start playing, just have fun and see what you like. If you have any questions for me on anything Last Epoch, leave a comment down below or come hang out on Twitch and ask me live. I'll do my best to answer anything. But most importantly, I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you liked it and subscribe for more amazing, super entertaining RPG content like this. I hope you enjoy your adventures in Last Epoch, and I can't wait to see what we talk about next.